Hello, YouTube friends. I'm Naomi Light. I'm a coach, and I want to share with you a conversation that I had with mine, a friend of mine called Pete Larkham. Now, Pete is a trainer, and he goes into workplaces to help them understand mental health and wellness. And he brought up the challenge in this conversation of what you do when there's somebody in your life whose mental health you have concerns over. And that situation crops up for many of us. What do we do? Do we ignore it and hope it will go away? Do we suggest that the person goes to see the doctor? Do we research medication and help them find a way to medicate their difficulties? What do we do? Because there seems to be so much taboo about mental health and so many people experiencing extreme stress or burnout or breakdown or depression or anxiety. And so my conversation with Pete was about those topics and just some really practical ways that you can begin to think about your own or other people's mental health, what to do when you're stuck or when you're panicking, how to access help and what things are in your control and are not in your control when it comes to situations in your life. So this is the recording that I made with him. You should know that after about three minutes, the um, reception on his end of the call dropped. And so we made an audio only recording um, for the last part of this. So I've been able to pop up some of the questions that he asked and refer you to some of the resources. Um, so enjoy my conversation with Pete Larkham. But why don't you start by talking about what it is you do for a job and what and how, like why are you interested in like well-being and mental health? Okay. So Pete Larkham, nice to meet you. Um, I am a mental health first aid instructor. And what that means is mental health, uh, we understand and kind of getting a better understanding of. Um, but first aid, it's looking at mental health from a first aid perspective. So with first aid, the person in front of me is fallen over, hit their head on the floor, what do I need to do? How do I react? How do I respond? Call 999, we kind of get that process. Um, mental health first aid is very much if a person in front of me is showing signs and symptoms of, what do I do? How do I get the conversation started? Um, and how do I keep them as safe as possible? So I work across all sectors. So I do uh, youth venues and churches and volunteer groups and uh, bigger companies like WH Smiths and BBC and uh, financial companies and all kinds of stuff. Um, so I really do cover all the bases and then I go into NHS and do nurses and midwives and so it, it takes me all over the place because actually from my perspective people are people regardless of what job role we have. Um, and one of the statements which I use within the course is that stress is the number one cause of mental health illnesses uh, oh. and we are all wow. engaged in special mm. activities. Uh, in essence when we do a, an activity on it, I, I finish off the activities by saying life is stressful, you mm -hmm. know? Um, but then when we begin to put a context on it, it's actually a lack of control that's stressful. So there is stuff going on in the background of my life that is out of my control. Mm -hmm. And so then there are two questions off the back of that, which is, can I regain control of these things? In which case, great, I can, I can sort that out. But what about those stresses that are out of my control? So. Uh, family illness or um, redundant. Yeah. So, so that's just a massively helpful distinction. There are some things that we can't control and some things we can, and we respond differently depending on whether it's in our control. So could I, could I ask you some questions then, Pete, about when a person has a situation that causes stress, which causes mental health in their life, but it's something that they can't control. Yes. What do you talk about? <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so basically kind of you're suffering with mental health illnesses because life is out of control at the moment. Um, and it feels like there's nothing that you can do to keep it within your control. And in essence, that's why you are so stressed. Um, 
with that context, what we are then looking at is, well, what can we engage with? And there's a process out there called the Great Dream, which is just a brilliant acronym, okay? Uh, if you were to Google Great Dream and mental health, then you should come up with an image. Um, and the great stands for give. If you can give into somebody else's life, it will make you feel good. So basically looking to find somebody who has a need and then to provide for that need in whatever capacity you've got. The R is then relate. So build relationships. We know that when people are isolated and alone, they struggle with their mental health. So this is about where are my friends? Where are my work colleagues? Where is my family? Who can I begin to build relationships with uh, in the people around me? The E is then exercise. And the recommended uh, exercise is three times a week for 45 minutes per session. And then I've got to be open and honest and say that if you're me, it's from here to my car, car to my house, house to my sofa, <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> that's where, um, where a lot of us don't really give ourselves time for exercise and to go out and do exercise, uh, even though we know that it is good for our mental health. Uh, the A is for appreciate. If we can appreciate the world around us, and this is about engaging our five senses. So uh, when was the last time we ate something and we thought, oh my gosh, that tastes amazing. Or we saw something, smelt something, heard something, touched something, and allowed our senses to really come alive. And then the T is for trying out something new. So learning something new. When we learn something new, our brain comes alive. So what are the activities that we could do for ourselves that give, relate, exercise, appreciate, and try out new things that are gonna be good for my own well-being, like for my own mental health? The dream aspect is more about I need somebody else alongside me who can help me explore my dreams. And the dreams stand for having a direction for your life, having a goal, knowing what it is that you want to achieve. Um, so what does success look like for you? Because unless you know what success looks like, not. Um, and then you've got the R, which is for resilience. And now resilience is an interesting statement because when you start looking at resilience, you'll find a whole load of other statements that explain what resilience is, but we never really learn or know how do we build resilience. And resilience comes down to your core belief systems. So the things that govern the way you live your life. And the example I give on this is if I believe that I am of worth, I will naturally treat other people as if they are of worth. If I don't believe I'm of worth, I will naturally trash on other people. Um, but then, we need to understand that there are loads of things that we have begun to believe in our life that aren't actually true. Uh, and this goes down to uh, keep calm, carry on, don't pay your don't to laundry, wants to hear your stuff, leave your stuff at the door and then come into work. And these cultures that we live in or these belief systems that we live in that aren't actually true. And so how do we begin to, to tackle that? Uh, and another example is that a couple of my neighbours have just had extensions. And as I've looked out my bedroom window, I've had this internal thought that says, I need an extension, uh, but I don't need an extension, you know? Um, but there's something about the keeping up with the Joneses that becomes a belief system that starts to say, I need that job, I need to do this, I need to earn that much money, I need that car, I need... And it just begins to put more and more pressure on ourselves. So resilience, what is resilience and how do we begin to build that in our lives? Then you've got emotions. And now in the context of emotional literacy, emotions is all about understanding what you feel, but then understanding why you feel like that. Because as soon as you put those two pieces of information together, you can start to change your life by asking yourself, do I want to still feel like this? And then you can start to change different aspects of your life. So that's a DRE and then A, is acceptance and there's the serenity poem. I don't know if you've ever come across the serenity poem, but it's uh, give me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change and change the things I can. And again, this comes back to what is it that's within our control and how can we change things or let go of them? Because um, it's also about that wisdom to know the difference between the two. Uh, and then we've got the M, which is about meaning, you know? and being part of something that is bigger than ourselves. In essence, in the context of that, when we feel like so much of our lives is out of our control, these are 10 things that we can do to begin to regain control 
over just the little things in our lives that begin to increase our positive mental health. Oh, that is so helpful, that acronym. I, I'm going to um, attach uh, in the notes the, um, that written out for, for the list. One of the things I've heard you say is the way that you really make the link between what we talk of about as, as mental health. You know, so, so often things that have labels like depression or anxiety or panic attacks or like how those relate to um, a kind of everyday experience of stress. Because I think sometimes for, for somebody who maybe doesn't have a diagnosis of, you know, this is a mental health condition I have, it can seem like it's, you know, far away and unrelatable to. And probably for people who do have a mental health condition, they can feel a bit like an us and them. How do you see those things working together, like everyday stress and mental health? So, I mean, we do have a lot of labels out there of anxiety, depression, schizophrenia, bipolar, self-harm, eating disorders and suicide. Then all those are very happy topics in themselves. <laughs> um, but how do we actually understand when does something become an issue? When does it become a need for diagnosis? Um, and the best way to begin to explore this is, first and foremost, I need to know what normal is. Because there is a normal uh, level of weird within Pete Larkham. This is just the way I am. Um, and the people who know me best know that this is just the way I am. But when something begins to change from normal, that's when we need to have some alarm bells going off. Um, and then the question is, how often do we really allow ourselves to open up with people to show them that we're not okay? Because most of the time, you were to say, hey, Pete, how are you doing? And my response would be, yeah, no problem. How about you? And it's almost as if I'm saying, let's get it off me and back onto you as quickly as possible so I don't have to open up uh, and share anything. Um, but also in the midst of it, you coming to me, you need to understand, well, why am I going and talking to Pete in the first place? And this comes back to creating evidence or collecting evidence. Now, the police love evidence because you can't dispute evidence. So in the context of me coming and saying, hey, Naomi, I just want to ask, how are you getting on? When you turn around and say, no, my world is wonderful, then I can actually say, well, the reason I'm asking you is because I've noticed these changes. And what you're then saying to the person is I have seen you. Yeah. And I know that you're not your normal self. Uh, and it just allows the person to then open up that little bit further. Um, and blokes aren't very good at this. Girls are, are much better at, at verbal communication than, than boys are. Um, and when females have face-to-face -face communication it's normally over a table having a drink or having a meal and you can see all these other signs and symptoms you know so if I were to say Nemi how are you doing and you said oh fine and you then tell me how wonderful your life is because we're sat across from one another I can then begin to notice all the other things that are going on do you know when you've had a conversation with someone and you can just tell there is something else going on underneath the surface um and with that, it's then being able to have the courage and pluck up the courage to say, is everything really okay? Because then if they pop it off a second time, that's when you say, okay, I'm asking because I've noticed these changes. Because as soon as you begin to show them or tell them what it is you've seen, they can't dispute that. They can't argue against it because it's a reality. Does that help? Yes, um, that so does. So then, really about how, how are we able to be real with the people around us and how do we pick up on what is normal what is beginning to change um because it's the changes that we're looking out for in the context of anxiety and depression the normal Pete Larkin is just beginning to do something different so that does that make sense it um, does. Yeah, it totally makes sense and it really kind of re-emphasizes the importance of self-awareness in understanding what your normal is. Yes. You know, if and you're talking about it from, um, I might reflect to you that I've noticed some things, does that work on a, a self-reflection level? It can do. Because actually, yeah, firstly, I need to understand, well, how am I uh, today? And 
people who can be self-aware are actually doing quite well in their mental health. <laughs> uh, even if their self-aware statement is, I'm really not doing okay. The first, I mean, if you were to, to say to anyone, they would tell you that the first road to recovery, uh, the first step to recovery is knowing that you need to change, yeah. knowing yeah. that something changed. So yeah, the self-reflection is really important. Yeah. And um, yeah, and I suppose noticing that you have a range within the normal, you know, a person has maybe normal on a kind of more stressful day and yes. normal on I'm, I'm on holiday and I've got no worries kind of day. Totally. And I suppose kind of then the context of where does it become mental health is the longevity. How long have these changes been going on for? Uh, and in the context of diagnosis, for a diagnosis of anxiety or depression, the symptoms, the high level of symptoms, need to be present for two weeks or more. Um, so this isn't just a bad day, and it's not even a bad week, but this is a bad few weeks. And, and for some reason, you just can't shake it off. Um, you're not having any good days in the midst of this. This is only bad days. Yeah, wow. Well, that actually surprises me that it's that short. Well, most people, once we have a few bad days, we begin to change some stuff and move on. And often bad days occur because of circumstances and then those circumstances change and the stress levels kind of ease off. Um, but one of the analogies that I give right at the beginning of a mental health course is if you can imagine that there are signs and symptoms of mental health illnesses just through the door, then you can get nice and close to the door but if you don't cross that threshold, you won't get the diagnosis of mental health illnesses. So we can still cope with a lot of levels of stress, but we won't necessarily need that diagnosis. But also in life, stuff happens. Uh, and so I kind of talk about things happening in three. So like a relationship breakup or a death in the family or a car accident. Those are the kind of pressures that we then push us closer to the door. So if we have a nice big protective factor between me and the door, a nice big gap, then I won't go through the door. But if I'm standing next to the door when those life events happen, that's when I, I'm going to be through the door before I realise it. But a lot of people don't realise that the stresses that are going on in the background of their lives are actually leaving them right next to the door with very little room for manoeuvre. Yeah, that is, that's so interesting. I like, um, if you were one of those people who just in your everyday life, you had a, you know, a level of stress that might mean that something happens and you get pushed over. Um, like how, like what are some of the symptoms that you think would, would show up? Um, patterns of behavior. So this isn't just one-offs, but this has become a norm. Um, and it could be that you're going to work early or getting home late. It could be that you're avoiding social situations. It could be that you're eating more than you would normally do or you're sleeping less or sleeping more. It could be that you're eating less or that you're restricting things. It could be that you're exercising. The list goes on and on <laughs> and on. Uh -huh. um, but in essence, the main question is, has this changed from normal? Yeah. Yeah, that's so helpful. That's really helpful. Um, and, and I suppose a, a really like kind of obvious question in all this is if I am concerned that um, somebody is crossing over or, you know, going through the door, as you put it in your analogy, someone I know, um, yeah. I'm concerned that I'm, you know, going through the door and I'm experiencing more extreme uh, mental health concerns. What, What's, the, what's a good thing to do? So there are a number of things. Um, firstly, get hold of a friend and let them know that you're struggling. Secondly, get yourself to the GP. Um, go and see your doctor and explain to your doctor that you're beginning to, to really struggle. Also, let them know how long has this process been going on for. Um, what, what we've then got is the, the difference between a GP versus the EAP, which is the Employees Assistance Program. Now, if there's anyone out there who is linked to a company of 20 people or more, the company should have access to an employee's 
program. And the Employees Assistance Program offers some help and support. So this can be financial support, legal support, but in the context of mental health, it's access to counselling. Now, in the UK, the Employees Assistance Program is the quickest way to access counselling at the moment. So if you imagine on day one, I go to the GP and the GP says, you know what, come back in a couple of weeks and then we'll be able to assess whether or not this is a mental health illness. So then I come back to the doctor two weeks later and then the doctor will say, you know what, yeah, okay, I'll give you a diagnosis and we need to refer you to counselling. There then will be a phone call that I receive about three weeks later. So I'm now five weeks from day one where I then receive a phone call and they assess, do I still need access to counselling? And then a referral will be made and it can take up to three months for me to access counselling uh, through the GP. Um, if I engage with the Employers Assistance Programme on day one at the same time as going to the GP, then the Employers Assistance Programme will put me through to a counsellor on day one. And then I can say to the counsellor, I'm beginning to really struggle with my mental health and I'd like to access some kind of counselling, whether it's therapy or, or counselling. Um, can you help? And then they will say, yep, no problem. And they'll make the referral on day one. And you will then engage with the counselling process by week two or around week two. The Employers Assistance Programme will then offer you counselling for approximately three months while they wait for the NHS to catch up. And then hopefully you'll be able to access ongoing counselling through the NHS. Wow, that, that um, difference between day three and week five or no, month five we were at. Mm. Um, that's massive, isn't it? Mm. So hence why actually for your role in going to businesses and talking about um, accessing help is so critical because there is a way to, to become, you know, to get support much sooner. Yes, totally. And maybe not every, not all employees know that. Well, today I was in a room with 25 people from a construction company that will remain nameless. And I said, how many people know about the Employers Assistance Programme? And most of the hands went up. I then said, okay, how many people know how to access the Employers Assistance Programme? And uh, half of those hands and went down. Um, and then I said, so how many people have actually accessed the Employers Assistance Programme? And there was nobody in the room that had actually accessed the Employers Assistance Programme. Um, the Employers Assistance Programme is totally free and totally anonymous. So it doesn't go on your record um, and it is totally available to everybody within the company if the company has approximately 20 to 50 employees or more. Um, but most people don't even know that it exists because half of the room didn't even know that it existed. No, half of them, three quarters of the room, sorry, didn't know how to access and then nobody had actually accessed it. No, oh, fascinating. That's absolutely brilliant. Yeah, so, um, Pete, have you got any um, stories? I'm wondering whether in your own life um, you have any stories of how an awareness of mental health, mental health first aid and an awareness of what your normal, I put you a bit on the spot here, but... Um, Ha has worked and you've been able to notice and get the support, maybe the great dream acronym, any of the ways that that's worked for you personally? For me personally, I think a big thing that I have to be careful of is because I'm dealing with this topic day in and day out, and I'm dealing with the emotional vulnerability of a lot of people in a week, it's about making sure that I'm okay. One of the statements that I use in the, in the session is that I am actually the most important person in my life. Um, because if I break, who then supports everything and everyone that I'm supporting? So a lot of the time I have to go through the emotional questions of think, why am I doing this? I, I focus a lot around behaviours. Why do I act like this? Why do I react like this? Um, and now you know I have three small children and and sleep deprivation kicks you sideways, you know? Um, and actually, you then are just tired or more tired at the end of the day, or uh, there's just other stresses going on. And then you kind of add in financial insecurity or X, Y, or Z, and that creates other stresses. So I'm on a fairly regular basis 
asking yourself, what's the behavior that I'm engaged in? And how can I build my own resilience in the context of that? Um, around the give and relate and uh, exercise. Exercise is probably the one that I fall down on most um, because some people like exercise, whereas I like to sit on the sofa and watch Netflix with a bag of, bag of crisps and a beer, you know? Um, exercise is probably one of those areas that I could do on. But the other stuff I, I engage with on a fairly regular basis. And also because of the, the management thing that I do alongside it, I'm also then in engaging people with what are your hopes and what are your dreams, what are your aspirations. And a lot of my talks are motivational, which then means that if I'm not living it for myself, then I'm a little bit hypocritical. So I try and put as much as I can into practice. And I think that's what keeps me mentally okay most of the time. Yeah. Yeah, it's so good. It's down to earth, easily accessible advice, oh, is specific. it? Specific. No, no, it's good. None of this is rocket science, but I think it's just helpful to make an association between, you know, my decisions to recognize that I'm the most important person in my life, as you put it, and, uh, you know, the quality of sleep with my resilience and how long I can kind of stay on the right side of the door is just, is really helpful. Yeah. yeah. So good. Um, so I think it's been it's been a really good conversation. Um, I wonder, Pete, do you know of any other books or resources that um, really are helpful in this all of talking about all this stuff? Uh, this comes up a lot in the course. So have you got anything you can recommend? And my honest answer is no. Uh, the reason being is because for me to try and keep up with all the literature that's coming out is, is next to impossible. <laughs> um, Certainly read people's books, like read autobiographies of people that you know who have struggled with mental health um, and just hear their insight to it. Uh, I mean, a random example is that I was actually listening to Michael McIntyre's um, book, audio book, autobiography. And this is a guy that you would not put mental health and Michael McIntyre in the same kind mm. of context. Um, and yet he openly in his book was talking about the struggles that he went through before he hit it big uh, and just how low he got in the midst of it. And now he doesn't go and say, I was struggling with mental health illnesses, but he just kind of gave a window into the reality that struggles are a part of life. Yeah. Um, we all hit them. But it's about, do I have a self-belief that says I'm going to be able to get through this? And that self-belief in itself is, is gold, you know? A lot of mental health also, if I can be as bold as to say, a link to personal insecurities, not having a self-belief, not believing that I can. Um, and that's where mental resilience really does come in, is, is this, this ability to keep believing in your own ability to carry on, you know, no matter how hard it gets, and then having a network of people around you. Um, I would totally recommend the Mental Health First Aid course. I can't recommend it highly enough. Um, and if you're interested, I can give you dates of courses, but that's not what this is about. But it, it, if you would like to support people better, that is a great course to engage with. If you want to support yourself better, it's a great course to engage with. Um, and then through that course, you'll also be able to hit all the resources, and all the background information that that course gives you, of which there is a ton and a half um, of extra background stuff. So anything specific, I'm afraid I can't because it's there's too much out there. Yeah, um, no, there is. But, but look at it, just just get engaged. There's a couple of books. Well, one of the books is kind of The Black Dog, which is fairly well well known. Um, but there are more videos coming out as well. Go on to A Time for Change uh, website and look at some videos or um, just mind. There's loads of resources on, on the Mental Health First Aid website, which is mhfaengland.org, uh, and look for resources. And just kind of look at, look at stuff there that can help increase your own personal mental health and then support other people in the midst as well. That well, uh, for saying no, no resources, that was a, a great list of resources <laughs> you gave out there. 
Um, so Pete, for, for people, um, cause obviously you're local to me in Winchester area, for people who live in say the South of England, London or surrounding, are yeah. there any um, mental health first aid courses or events that we could access? Give, I mean, give us the details and the dates. Yeah, so for me, I deliver courses every month uh, in Winchester and in London. So I'm based in London and Winchester uh, every month to do courses. Um, but in essence, go onto the Mental Health First Aid website and search your area and see who comes up. Otherwise, click on, click on the, the search bar, type in Peter Markham, see what courses I've got going on and see if you can attend. If you have a core group of between 10 to 16 people that you would like to train, then I can come in. I can... Um, are you there? Yeah, yeah, we got um, So if you've got 10, or 10 to 16 people, I can do that as an in-house course and I can do that for you. Uh, and then the course costs begin to reduce. Um, but obviously if you attend a course, then that's a, a, a cost which needs to cover all my other costs in the background. So um, yeah, the cost for a two day course is 300 pounds per person plus VAT. Uh, the cost for a one day course is 150 pounds plus VAT. And the cost for a half day course, which is four hours long, is 75 pounds per person plus VAT, unless you're doing it as an in-house course, in which case those costs will reduce um, by a margin. Oh, that's brilliant. That's really helpful. Well, thanks so much, um, Pete, for sharing some of your insights into um, you know, our own personal awareness of our mental health and our wellness um, and all the resources that you've, you've mentioned. I will put all of the, those in you know, a list with, in the comments so that um, anybody can follow up those. But thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much for coming on the call. Oh, absolute pleasure. So thank you very much. Brilliant. Take care. See you soon.